Hi, good afternoon. My name is Karen Greenberg. I'm welcoming you to this wonderful podcast on the price of oil and its consequences for the future, or rather our webinar, not our podcast. I am the director of the Center on National Security at Fordham Law, which is hosting this discussion. With all the tension to COVID, to the election, to various crises around the world, one thing that we don't think is getting quite enough attention is the global economy, both as a national and a global security issue. Among the central elements in any discussion today of global economic considerations and concerns are the oil markets. Prior to COVID and the lockdowns, the oil markets were, in one of our panelists' words, humming along. And economists were focused on the risks and consequences of rising oil prices, not only on the markets directly, but on geopolitics generally. But by March, in the wake of the lockdown, we began to see a price war take place in the global oil markets. They have experienced a continuing instability and contrary to prior trend of rising prices, a decline in oil prices, increasing the debt burden of national oil governments and challenging the governments that support them. We're used to worrying about the consequences of high oil prices on the global economy, inflation, and the hit to consumers' pocketbooks. But now we've got another problem. What happens when no one wants the oil? COVID gave us a brief window into a no-demand world, and it was somewhat scary. Our panel today will talk about the medium and long-term consequences of a prolonged scenario of the lower demand world. Joining me today to help us better understand this long-term scenario are four panelists who can share with us their wealth of expertise and knowledge. Mark Kudis is the Chief Advisor for Finance and Investments and former Chief Financial Officer at Adnoc Group where in 2018, he set up the DeNovo Special Situations Unit. He was the former Chief Investment Officer of Global Special Situations at the Abu Dhabi Investment Council, and previously served as the CEO of Unicredit Co, HVB, and Chief Investment Officer of Shinsai Bank and Japan. Welcome, Mark. With us also today is Mahmoud El-Gamal, Professor of Economics and Statistics at the Baker Institute. He holds the chair in Islamic Economics, Finance and Management, also at Rice. Mahmoud was a former scholar and resident on Islamic finance for the US Department of Treasury, and he sits on the editorial board of the Review of Middle East Economics and Finance. In 2010, Mahmoud co-authored a book with our next guest. The book was entitled Oil, Dollars, Debt, and Crises, The Global Curse of Black Gold, co-authored by Amy Myers Jaffe, who is joining us as well. Amy Jaffe is the Managing Director of the Climate Policy Lab and Research Professor at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. She was the former director of the Program on Energy Security and Climate Change at the Council on Foreign Relations and is currently co-chair of the steering committee of the Women in Energy Initiative at the, Glo at the Center for Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. Amy is a prolific author. And in fact, the inspiration for today's panel really began with an article she wrote last spring in Foreign Affairs, which I encourage you to read entitled, Emergent Market Petrostates Are About to Meltdown. And finally with us is Daniel Freifeld, our moderator today. He is the founder of Callaway Capital Investment and former senior advisor to the Special Envoy for Eurasian en Energy at the US Department of State, where he was responsible for oil and gas issues in Iraq, Turkey, Russia, and the Eastern Mediterranean. He was also a program co coordinator for the Near East South Asia Center at the US Department of Defense working in countries throughout the Middle East. But I also have to add, it is my extremely special pleasure to have Danny Freifeld with us because Danny was with me at NYU when we started the predecessor to this center, the Center on Law and Security. And he was a lot of the energy and the intellectual sort of excitement for our mission, which has grown from terrorism and Middle East policy and governance to everything we'll be discussing today and more that's on our schedule. So I am incredibly delighted to welcome you, Danny. Um, today's session is on the record. Um, there'll be time for your questions at the end, but feel free to put them in the chat whenever you want. Um, and uh, Danny, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Karen, uh, and thank you for those kind words. And, and um, you know, this this discussion we're having today, which you know may indeed be the first of many on on this subject, is uh, it's quite ironic because it grew out of conversations you and I had. Uh, it's scary to think, but 12 or 13 years ago. Uh, you know, at, at $147 oil uh, about, you know, precisely the, the opposite driver. And I think that's, you know, a, a, uh, should give some humility, you know, whenever you have these kind of conversations that endeavor to make uh, 
forecasts about the consequences of the current uh, of, of any environment, you know, beyond six months is just how little we do truly know. Um, so in order to figure out what we do know, the way we'll structure this conversation is um, each panelist, uh, starting with Mark and then Mahmoud and then Amy will uh, give brief remarks about kind of the one or two things that they find um, both the most exciting and interesting and perhaps the least understood or appreciated. Uh, uh, that as a result of the, of the current kind of the feeling of a lower for longer price environment. Um, we'll then have a brief discussion among the four of us uh, uh, about some of the more salient points that the speakers make and then we'll open it up to questions more broadly. Um, so with that said, uh, we'd like to start with you, Mark, um, uh, to give a kind of overview of both what you think uh, is, is upon us or is apparent uh, uh, to be the kind of medium and long-term from consequences uh, of what's happened over the last really year or two. Um, and, and perhaps if you can also kind of identify some things that you think are, are leading indicators uh, of what's to come and, and, and that you see as kind of confirming some of your observations. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, let me try and put in context some of the broader, some of the broader trends. But before that, if I may, I'd like to uh, touch upon a couple of which may sound as fun facts, but perhaps from the vantage point of history, uh, years from now, it may make some sense or it, or, or, or it may not. But I think it's interesting that for 40 years, the US has struggled to gain energy independence. And right as we are on the cusp of gaining energy independence, uh, suddenly we realize that we may not necessarily need as much oil as we, you know, as we had envisioned before. And we've suddenly become uh, you know, one of the two largest energy producers. So in, in a sense, we struggled very hard to get here. Uh, we got here actually without the help of, of the government. And, uh, and, and I guess President Trump stumbled upon it. And, and now, as, as the U.S. has become, in, you know, virtually independent, uh, I, I don't think the demand for oil will be the same going forward. The second point is that it's interesting and ironic, again, that in the Eastern Mediterranean, there's a potential for a war that's brewing between neighbors, and it's over gas deposits. And the issue with the gas deposits is that if you look around the world, there's enormous amounts of gas everywhere. And in fact, you could almost argue that, yes, we know that gas is the bridge to the future, but in a sense, uh, given that there's so much gas around, there isn't as much demand going forward as we envision now with renewables popping in. The, the last point from the fun facts standpoint is that as we are entering into this energy transition phase, which I'm sure we'll touch upon later, uh, we're facing the prospect of a lot of stranded assets. And it's no surprise that Shell and BP they wrote off virtually, I think, $80 billion of assets with lower oil prices. So you have these enormous cross currents, and these cross currents are actually uh, touching upon the contours of the geopolitical issues that are affecting the world. And as they do, you're, you're beginning to see a splintering in, in different constituencies. You know, the, the unipolar world that we've had for a while is changing. We're going into more of a multipolar world. And I think Mahmoud will talk about this because there are definitely winners and losers. Just to touch briefly on them, um, I think China, which is a big you know, user of oil, lower oil prices are benefiting them. I think Russia, which has been a disruptive player uh, you know, for some time, given that they are a gas dependent economy and given that they haven't really been able to diversify their economy, over time will become less important. Having said that, um, they can still continue to be, to be disruptive. So overall, in the oil space, in, in the energy space, there's a lot going on. And what this COVID situation has demonstrated is that the energy transition is happening at a faster pace. This is not to suggest that we're gonna stop using oil, but the, the concept of peak supply, which now seems funny, it now has morphed into peak demand. And it's more likely that we have hit peak demand, what we had at 100 million barrels. And from here, 
going forward, we will be going down in terms of, of demand. That's it, uh, just a few comments to, to begin with. Thank you, Mark. Um, uh, and we'll again follow up with each of you with some, you raised some interesting points that I already want to ask about. Uh, Mahmoud, uh, we hear from you next, please. Uh, okay, so the, the angle I want to shed some light on, which I think is underappreciated in discussion of low oil prices, is the uh, preeminence of the dollar in the global financial system. Uh, people have been puzzling over how the world is becoming more multipolar from a pure security standpoint, but the U.S. financial hegemony um, is still there. The dollar is still um, the main currency as um, uh, a currency reserve now countries have gold reserves as well but the reported currency reserves at least 62 percent of those are in dollars uh 80 percent of uh, all foreign exchange transactions are in dollars 40 percent of all trade transactions are carried out in dollars between countries that are not trading directly with the us so um this has been uh, the financial, the global financial system that we've had since the 1970s when the link between the US dollar and gold was severed when President Nixon first closed the gold window and then officially um, ended the Bretton Woods uh, system. And from its inception, petrodollars were very much part of the, uh, the global dollar-based financial system. In 1974, uh, officially, Saudi Arabia agreed that they are going to price their oil uh, in dollars uh, and invest the bulk of the petrodollars in dollar-denominated assets. 1976, they got the rest of OPEC to agree to this. Uh, to a large extent, uh, Germany and Japan uh, were exchanging U.S. security for holding uh, mainly dollars uh, as the primary reserve. So uh, the link between geopolitics and the dollar financial system has always been there, but now uh, people are wondering why the dollar remains the preeminent currency. And I think people don't recognize that low oil prices, as Mark has pointed out, they're beneficial to the oil importers, like China. They are harmful to the oil exporters, like Saudi Arabia and, and other OPEC countries. And just to throw, without slides, to throw numbers that, that people can keep in mind, approximately Saudi exports are of the order of about 10 million barrels per day. Chinese imports are roughly in the same neighborhood, about 10 million barrels per day. That translates if oil is at $80 a barrel, which is roughly the break even point for fiscally for a country like Saudi Arabia, that's about $300 billion a year. When you cut that in half at $40 per barrel, that's $150 billion that Saudi Arabia doesn't have as surpluses that normally would have been recycled. Uh, into dollar denominated assets. Simultaneously, the importing countries like China, instead of paying $300 billion, are paying $150 billion. So that's another half $150 billion of Chinese surplus that need not be recycled uh, uh, the way petrodollars uh, used to be recycled. Uh, and so as we go forward, we know that oil exporting countries are running out of their uh, savings, uh, the sovereign wealth funds, um, are, are depleting their, 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 um, their savings in order to close their, their fiscal uh, gaps. Um, so we can easily see this extra surplus that China has not being recycled into dollars, but actually recycled in order to help out these GCC countries. And then they can demand that they, the oil that they continue to be buying for the next 10 to 20 years would be priced in yuan instead. And that would fit perfectly with the financial infrastructure that China has been building in order to try to break out of this um, dollar hed financial hegemony. Um, uh, 2009, they officially uh, declared a policy of trying to internationalize the renminbi. Uh, 2015, they launched um, KIPS, which is, which is a way to do interbank um, transactions in order to get around SWIFT and CHIPS, which allows you, sort of forces you to be under uh, the, the arm of, of US law and therefore uh, is a vehicle for, for financial sanctions and other forms of, of, of uh, hard American power. Um, they uh, introduced a gold exchange, gold futures exchange that's Yuan uh, based in 2017 in Hong Kong. And that gets around the problem that Yuan is not as liquid as the dollar and therefore people will be willing to, um, to hold yuans because they can always convert them into gold and then from gold go into any other currency that they wish to use for trade. 2018, they introduced uh, 
uh, the International Energy Exchange where they started trading uh, oil futures in yuans. Um, so uh, increasingly, um, China has the infrastructure in place so that when the next financial crisis hits, um, there may be another uh, impetus for the world to at least migrate part of uh, its reserves and transactions to other currencies. The dollar is too important, too central to just completely disappear. But what is possible over the next 10, maybe 20 years is to end up with a multipolar financial world where we have different currencies playing the same global role that the dollar is now playing within the region, say in Asia and in Europe. So I'll stop here and, and we can pick up the pieces in, in questions. Super, um, thank you. And Amy? Well, let me build on what Mahmoud has presented uh, and put it in a little bit wider geopolitical context. Um, and might also explain, you know, the rise in gold and people's interest in gold as Mahmoud's explained how China is building its participation in that market. So the United States, to the extent that it wants to deter China from certain international security issues, uh, which we can elaborate out in discussion, um, in addition to some of the harder power tools, um, you know, the United States has two leverages over China to prevent China uh, from taking advantage of any leverage it might have over the United States. One of those is the dollar hegemony. So, um, you know, the possibility or risk uh, that China could lose access to the banking system. We put sanctions on certain uh, members of the Communist Party. Um, China's seen us kick other people out of the banking system. So um, it's not not, um, not a small risk for China. Um, and the second thing, of course, is the United States dominance in the semiconductor uh, area. So putting that in the broad context, I, I return us back for a minute to last March, where a lot of people felt that the Trump administration took a strong role um, in the sort of what I call the Plaza Accord for oil, because we had this building surplus of oil that was literally could have been a crisis from running out of storage that would have prevented um, the operation of the international system in oil, but also, um, and, and as I wrote about in Foreign Affairs, the potential to create a major um, sovereign credit crisis. And I'm gonna deep dive into a little bit of that uh, right now, um, because the United States had a concern itself with uh, the possible, you know, weakening of the financial system, you know, not through the traditional route. Um, I mean, obviously there was concern IMF forgave debt for the low income economies and there was concern about how those economies would be able to cope with COVID. Um, but just to give you some sort of off the beaten path statistics that people don't write about maybe ever, right? The average debt load of national oil companies worldwide has increased, has doubled over the last 15 years. Um, the, uh, uh, the Eurasia in the Middle East alone this year has $35 billion in maturing external sovereign debt. Um, most of the oil states around the world have based their budgets on $50 or higher. Um, so even though we're not, we're out of the woods because we're not at negative $37 oil, um, you know, there's still, I think, a question about whether, um, the risk in the sovereign credit market is underpriced, uh, given the following things. I'll just throw out a few examples. Uh, as Mark mentioned, not all states are equals. Uh, you have countries like uh, the UAE that has uh, actually made preparedness to the energy transition a cornerstone of its development plan. Um, you see some activity in that direction in Saudi Arabia as well. Um, by contrast, uh, Pemex, the national oil company of Mexico, has $30 billion in bonds due in 2024. Uh, their losses in 2019 were $18 billion. Um, you have Petrobras uh, has $79 billion in debt, uh, which is double its pre-tax earnings back when oil prices were $70. Um, uh, let's see, who else? Uh, Iraq? Uh, has a national annual budget of around $100 billion. They had assumed a $56 oil price. Um, at the, before the corona crisis, uh, they had about $62 billion 
in uh, foreign exchange reserves. Um, given their budget deficit and the price of oil today, one could expect that um, foreign exchange surplus to run out, if not this year, then in next, in next year. Um, uh, Nigeria has a annual debt service cost of $7 billion. Uh, they base their budget this year on uh, $57 oil. Um, so, I mean, there are a lot of features um, of, of how, you know, persistently low oil prices, and, you know, this week we have declining oil prices, which I can talk about later, having to do with the inventory situation and sort of pessimism about demand. Um, you know, you, you have this uh, possible failures of national oil companies coming down the road, and you think about the cycle, we all watch the cycle in Venezuela, so I have this debt, um, I can't make new investments, then all of a sudden I can't even make the, so I can't have my capacity go up, but maybe I even get into a problem where I can't even maintain capacity. You know, Venezuela used to have to spend four to six billion dollars a year just to prevent the decline curve from asserting itself. Um, so you're talking about other countries um, that have, I mean, Venezuela had an unusually high decline rate of 25%, but most countries have a decline rate of eight to 10%. It takes a lot of money to spending um, to prevent that from asserting itself. Um, and then the other aspect, um, so you know, we might get into a situation where we're back to the oil cycle. So when people talk about oil prices being persistently low, um, you know, Mahmoud and I have written this book and I, I still believe, even, even though I do believe that the demand trends with the energy transition are going in a different direction, we're not out of the cycle. Um, because to the extent that this cycle um, makes the debt situation for national oil companies worse and worse over time, um, those companies that don't are unable to respond um, will have uh, uh, could be the like the threshold for the next up cycle. Um, but the other thing in terms of U.S. national power, um, you know, we have these deep alliances in the Gulf, uh, and that's another reason why. Um, you know, the, this administration uh, pulled those ties when we saw that this um, sovereign credit mess for Mexico and other countries was important to the United States. We made that clear to our allies in the Gulf and uh, they turned themselves around uh, and got made a deal with the Russians um, to kind of stabilize the market. But we're used to also being able to offer the petrodollar surplus through a co similar kind of coordinated effort, right? Where well, let me give you a couple examples. 2009, it was Qatar that bailed out Barclays, right? They also provided credit to UBS and Credit Suisse. It was the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority that bought $7.5 billion worth of city bonds. That was like a bridge loan that kept city from having difficulty. And, uh, and then I think you have to ask the question, in a future financial crisis, if the Gulf does not have surplus petrodollars, um, what influence would the United States have on, um, on influencing the uh, financial flows? And, and it's, it's, it's an important issue because we have so much cross-investment today. You know, if you think about the way portfolio management goes, you've got a lot of pension funds, you know, from different parts of the world that are now in the indexes and the Saudi Arabian stock markets in the index and the Abu Dhabi stock markets in the index. So for example, the Abu Dhabi Security Exchange is down 27% in the first half of this year. So, so there's a lot of contagion that can happen um, across the financial community because everybody's invested in these different financial exchanges, not just in China, which I know a lot of people focus on in the market, but even these exchanges um, in oil states and in other countries in the Middle East. So I kind of like throw that out there um, as a, yet another issue to chew on. Yeah, Amy, that's really the thread that ties this together, which is um, the, the only tool that the United States would have in a future global financial crisis to uh, re-inject uh, or to support the solvency of uh, petro states and over-levered borrowers from Mexico and Brazil and the Western Hemisphere to 
the Gulf itself. And, you know, there's plenty of Southeast Asian economies as well whose sort of future growths are predicated on the realization of cash flows from hydrocarbons would be to inject dollar liquidity. And that in and of itself is what Mahmoud is talking about, is it sows the very seeds of the degradation of dollar preeminence. Um, you know, where did the dollar preeminence come from? You know, it started with the surpluses that the U.S. had with the world. And as a creditor nation, you were able to dictate the currency in which uh, those debtor nations that you trade with ultimately save in. And so if we can't draw on flush liquid dollar savings, you know, through sovereign wealth funds or, you know, international reserve piles in the Gulf to bail out countries and financial institutions in a financial crisis, we have to essentially hypothecate or print the money, which is what we're doing now, right? And that injection of liquidity, which can allow you to service this debt in perpetuity, is going to itself be uh, the, the, the seeds of uh, either at best a, a multipolarity of currencies, right? And, and sort of regional trade. Um, so that I think is kind of thematically what puts it together. But, but in particular, um, I have a, just as a personal interest, Mark, why do you think, you know, is the Eastern Mediterranean and are these, you know, even the South China Sea and a lot of these sort of, you know, flashpoint disputes that still exist in the world, you know, they are characterized in terms of, you know, a scramble for resources. But why do people still care? I mean, is, it, is that really just nationalism and, and, you know, jingoism that's sort of masking as an economic uh, yeah, imperative? It, it, Exactly. It's fascinating. And this is why I think it's ironic. In a way, it reminds me almost of the wars of Yugoslavia in the 90s when, you know, there was this mad scramble for land in Yugoslavia. And meanwhile, you, you had the internet that was beginning to, to grow across, you know, the world. So, you know, what, what's the point? You know, would we go to war because of the Senkaku, the islands that are off Japan, that, that are also, you know, sought after by the Chinese? Eastern Med began to gas. You, you've got so much gas everywhere. I mean, if you think about Africa, people don't talk about, about that. Africa is full of gas. And there are ways of bringing it out using like FLNG floating, LNG vessels. There's all kinds of ways. But we still live in the mindset that is probably 40, 50 years behind. And that's what I was trying to allude to by saying that right at the point when we finally achieve energy independence, Energy is not going to be as important as we migrate to the future. But I wanted to just touch upon the point you said before that, oh, you know, the dollar is one of the strong points that we have. Well, it is, but we've weaponized the dollar and we're making people averse to being in the dollar zone. And this concerns me a lot because I don't think American audiences have been able to piece together why this is important. In a very kind of straightforward fashion, we run a current account deficit, which means obviously that we're borrowing more from overseas than we you know with our own savings. It's a savings mismatch. As long as we can borrow money from others, we don't have to change our standard of living. I mean, imagine if you wanted to buy something, you took out a piece of paper from your wallet, wrote down an IOU, gave it to someone, and then acquired the asset, and they acquired the piece of paper. This is what's been going on. So imagine if the world decides to hold fewer dollars, what it will mean automatically is higher interest rates in the US and we will pay more for goods. I mean, that's kind of really basic. Then further down the road, that means obviously lower GDP, we have to work harder and we have to do with less. So every time I read about how we're kind of chasing people around and and going after their dollar deposits and trying to make life difficult for them, you know, people remember that. And I'm not suggesting that we should facilitate illegal cash flows, but we need to be very careful because, you know, in life, you're supposed to be care careful what you ask for because you just might get it. But if people start moving out of the dollar, it's going to be dramatic. And I lived through the 70s and I saw what it was like when the dollar was treated kind of like a garbage currency, the Deutschmark was preeminent, and interest rates were, you know, the sky high. Also, just for one moment, think about what happens to this massive debt that we've accumulated in the US and do some simple calculations. If suddenly 
interest rates go to 2%, two 10-year rates. And remember that the Fed has been telling us that they actually want to encourage higher inflation. Right now, everyone doubts it. But if they achieve their objective, then you're going to have higher rates and you're going to have to spend a lot more money financing that debt, rolling it over, which means we're going to have a lot less, essentially, funds for our budgets, for health care, for everything else. And think about how down the road, and it's not that far away, we have this enormous pool of unfunded health care liabilities and social security obligations. So I don't want to be a Pollyanna and describe something that will depress people. But you could see a situation developing where right at the worst possible moment, we suffer a decline in currency, higher interest rates, inflation, and turbulence around the world. So, so Mahmoud, I'll, I'll sort of ask you a question based on what Mark just said. Let, let's stipulate that you know, the, the weaponization of the dollar and the unsheathing of, or the use of you know, the dollar in furtherance of diplomatic objectives, you know, quite nakedly so, um, and, and I guess a, an abuse of privilege, some might say. Um, you know, that, if that's a contributor to the end of the dollar, you know, why the OPEC oil embargoes, you know, in the 1970s, um, that didn't itself precipitate the end of oil. And the reason is, you know, you need a substitute, right? Uh, and, you know, I think it'd be hard to argue that today the preeminence of the dollar is a function of trade with the United States or its status as a net creditor. It's rather just the convenience of invoicing in a currency that everybody kind of knows, you know, you're not subject to erratic movements, right? And so, you know, Colombia selling products to, you know, Angola is going to price them in dollars because they just both need to agree on some means of uh, transmission of value for services and goods. Uh, just as you couldn't substitute, you know, as much as we didn't want to be on oil in the 70s, there was no other source of energy for locomotion that, you know, had the same storage ability and energy potential, et cetera. So even if all of these things we can identify, you know, high, high deficits, carrying a lot of debt, uh, the end of petrodollar cycles, the weaponization of finance, so what, you know, why, how many data points do we have in history of reserve currencies ceasing to come, you know, other than the British pound, which maybe you'll talk about. Like, what is the alternative and why isn't it just the case that it happened to be the dollar, right? And it, dollar isn't American anymore. It just is the unit through which people conduct finance, you know, across borders. Well, uh, the, the dollar is our currency, but other countries' problem. Uh, that's that's what the former Secretary of the Treasury had said, right? And and to yes, Mark's the former Secretary was, of the Treasury, who happens to be eponymously named the Baker Institute, right? So I, <laughs> you guys all have to memorize that, I assume, right? <laughs> Um, so, and, and on the, uh, the potential abuse of, of privilege, uh, another Secretary of Treasury much more recently, Jack Kuhn said uh, that, you know, if, if, you, if you keep using sanctions, uh, eventually you erode the ability to impose sanctions because you're incentivizing people to move out of the dollar. Um, but you make a good point. What's the alternative? Um, the, the reaction is sometimes not continuous. So if you go back to, you, you started out talking about when oil was $148 a barrel, and as soon as everybody is saying, well, Americans are just driving as usual until gasoline prices hit $4 a gallon. And all of a sudden, people started selling out their eight-cylinder trucks and buying, uh, you know, small hybrid uh, family, family sedans. Um, so it's a question of how high is the cost that you're um, extracting from the global economy uh, compared to the convenience of having this currency that's available to everybody. And if you have a uh, multipolarity financially, there will be multiple currencies and people will be diversified holding some dollars, but also holding some yuan and some euro. And depending on whom they're transacting with, they may decide. We're already seeing some of that. Um, some of the over-the-counter trades, um, bilateral oil trades are denominated in euros, are denominated in yuans. Um, Actually, one of the scariest things now is cryptocurrencies. We saw Russia helping Venezuela issue a cryptocurrency. This goes through blockchain. You know, you, it doesn't go through the normal SWIFT chips uh, mechanism where the arm of the U.S. Treasury can reach it. Um, uh, China is just right now issuing its own 
the, the, the first that I know of uh, serious cryptocurrency that's issued by a central bank as yet another vehicle to provide alternatives. There, I saw a question in the Q&A where somebody saying, why don't we coordinate on some other global currency? There have been many initiatives, many suggestions of using the International Monetary Fund special drawing rights as a global currency. That never took off the ground because you know, the fund is a fund and therefore the, the ability to create money is very much constrained by its member countries and, and the US sort of has, has control over it uh, indirectly, pretty directly. Um, and so they, they're creating their own IMF alternative. So yes, until you have an alternative architecture, you will not be able to replace the dollar completely. And there's a lot of inertia. There are lots of network effects, economies of scale that will make it very difficult for the dollar to completely disappear. But you, you alluded to the British pound. I mean, if we go back to the end of the 19th century, we had globalization. The British pound was the preeminent currency. Um, mm -hmm. And it continued to be the preeminent currency into the 20th century when British military power and economic power had already eroded, but uh, Britain still had the Commonwealth and had the goodwill with the rest of the world where people were willing to continue to hold um, their reserves in, in British pounds. Then, um, you know, over the period between the 1920s and, and up to the Bretton Woods Accord in, in, in 46, uh, we saw the transition. So in the 20s, you saw 50% uh, of oil being traded in dollars and 50% in British pounds. It was only in the 1970s, really, that the U.S. made the deal with Saudi Arabia quite explicitly. Uh, we'll let you raise prices. We'll let OPEC, you know, a cartel, basically, compete with the oil majors uh, on, the, on, the, on the selling side. So we had, we had a, 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 a monopsony or, a, you know, an oligopsony, and let's create an oligopoly in order to counter the market power. Uh, we'll let you do that, provided that you give us something back, which is to solidify the dollar. Yeah. as the global currency. And that's been uh, of, of great value to the U.S. in terms of being able to project power both soft and, and, and hard. Um, eventually, there will be an alternative. Not, I mean, I, you know, I, I was born and raised in Egypt. We know empires come and go. We've seen them all. Um, the question really how quickly um, others can encroach on what has been essentially the American domain. Uh, and I think this can happen very quickly. People who study this have been warning us since the time of the last Great Recession on the financial crisis. This is coming. Uh, people like Betty Eichen Green and so on were, were saying, look, the yuan is coming, the euro is coming. It's a question of when, not if. Um, and the more we do it in a coordinated way, the better the outcome. If we end up with chaos and competition and trade wars, we may be repeating the same mistakes of the early 20th century, which was which were absolutely catastrophic. Except so now we have nuclear weapons. One, one of the you know sort of more interesting phenomena that uh, you know I'd be curious whether this is just coincidental or is related, but and you've written a bit about this is you know starting in the 2000s, but really accelerated since the financial crisis is the uh, securitization of finance for all of these small and large petro countries and producers, right? Whereas, you know, maybe in the 1980s, a syndicate of banks would get together and extend a loan to the Republic of Ecuador for the development of a specific oil resource secured against, you know, revenues derived from very specific barrels. And they may, you know, through non-recourse or recourse be in joint venture with an oil company who would be able to pledge collateral and provide transparency to cash flows, et cetera. And today we have countries as, you know, far afield as Mozambique and Suriname issuing, you know, 800 million to multi-billion dollar debt complexes that are sold off in pieces to uh, pension funds and investors all around the world. They are all denominated in dollars, by the way. There's obviously a samurai bond here and a you know dim sum bond there and maybe some pound and euro notes but it's basically dollars it, it's been disintermediated from the banks and they're held by everybody and and you have written and talked a lot about you know how are they going to pay this back right the money to pay this back is never going to materialize period right pemex cannot there is no solvency to pemex right it's only hope is a is a is an eternal refinancing right where you just keep kicking it down the road and this is different from one of the things I always loved was, you know, a, a uh, an offshore rig operator, you know, an oil field service company issuing a 2045 bond secured against an oil rig, right? 
And you know that that oil rig's gonna be out of service in 2035, right? But they're saying to you, we have, you know, in 2045, if we don't pay you back, you can get this rig, you know, which at that point is just 20,000 tons of steel. And, uh, but here you have these countries and a whole economic architecture that has been actually less formalized, you know, decentralized and pushed out through bonds. Everybody owns them. They're all supposed to be paying cash flows in dollars and they can't be paid back. If there is a crisis, which I mean, will there be a crisis, A, or do you think just rates stay low enough, long enough that it never, no one ever notices? And if there is, what does that do to the dollar? Um, and what does that do to the kind of system that we've all become accustomed well, to? Well, let me, let me start by breaking that down a little bit. Um, the IMF had a good report in October 2019 where it warned about this um, sort of unhealthy relationship between the national oil company credit rating and the sovereign credit rate, right? So there was this theory in international markets, like I love these theories that are developed because I, when I first began my career, you know, there was this 1970s concept that a sovereign country can't go bankrupt. Um, and then, you know, we found out that that wasn't really true. So this one is that the borrowing capacity and payback capacity of a national oil company is higher than um, and separate from sovereign debt. Um, and that seems like a dangerous uh, premise uh, to build a, a market on. Um, the second thing is, um, in the past, because it's a cyclical industry, you know, you had a mistake, and you happen to hold the high yield bonds on the six months where the oil price goes down, you know, your, your pension fund, like has to, you know, go to meet the board and, and explain why you made this mistake but somebody else whose bonds came due two years later looked like a genius, right? And so it, um, everybody thinks that they know what they're doing because you know, everybody didn't lose money all at the same time. The difference now um, is that, you know, what are the chances in today's world that this phenomenon that I think will happen, you know, where suddenly there's just like suddenly not enough oil because no one's doing CapEx, right? The capital investment's been down. And so what happens, you know, at some point, um, or the national oil companies, you get more Venezuelas. But, you know, the problem with that mentality is that regardless of whether you think the management of these ENPs in the United States are dumb or smart, um, you know, these assets are there. And the turnaround time is much faster. And even Exxon in a place like Guyana, um, or, or Total in the, in the East Med. I mean, the time at which these companies can bring on new oil uh, is so much faster that what we experienced, you know, uh, from 2000 to 2009, right, where we had, you know, seven years, I guess it wasn't quite 2000, maybe 2003 to 2009, where we had multiple years of rising, rising oil prices you know, how sustainable might that be? You know, I joke with people that the up cycle might have been the three months we went to $80 and now we're in the down cycle, right? And, you know, that could have been a cycle, right? So if the cycle is going to compress and be more volatile, then the ability of these countries to build up surpluses is going to be greatly constrained, even if the oil price goes back up again. And even if for six months or a year or two years, it's a great investment again, that could happen. But you know, from a national budgetary issue, when you have something like Petrobras owning, owing $80 billion, like what's the paradigm? How many years of high oil prices do they need, given the fact that they're in deep water and that's expensive? So I, that's where I think the disconnect comes, which is the market's inability to uh, understand the risk of whether the cycle is shortening and therefore the peaks might be slightly lower, they might last significantly shorter periods of time, and this sort of collection of capital that has bailed us out over and over and over again over the last 30 years might look different this time around. And then there's a second thing which I have a new book coming out on uh, that I focus on um, that's very unpopular, but you know people are coming around and calling me and asking me about it, is that now, so, you know, in the 70s, even in the 80s, you know, oil prices went really high and there just wasn't any alternative. But today there's really alternatives. And I'm not just talking electric cars. You know, I could not even own a car. 
right? And for the three times I need to go somewhere, I just, you know, hit Uber on my phone and Uber just announced they're going all electric, right? But you have other things. I mean, BP was announced today that BP is investing to take half of Equinor's uh, pro programs for offshore wind in Massachusetts um, and, and I think it was New York. Um, well, let me tell you something, you know, and that and then Mahmoud and others who are in Texas can speak to this, you know, when you have wind, um, especially if you get to the point which companies are looking at seriously, you take some of it and manufacture it into hydrogen. Um, you know, you don't need picking natural gas plants. So if you're exactly. an asset owner and you've invested in, you know, I won't name any names, uh, assets in Pennsylvania recently when you took over a certain company, like how are you going to monetize that gas in Pennsylvania if we're going to have a massive offshore wind program in, in the U.S. Northeast? Yeah. Right, because the peak, the, the need for peaking power from natural gas is going to decline over time. So you have these sort of structural things, and every time the prices for, I mean, I don't think the, I don't see the price of natural gas going up much, uh, except in some you know unusual case like Fukushima. So every time I see the oil price go up, then a major country, whether it's the EU or China or Brazil or someone. Um, is going to say, well, geez, um, I want to help my own industry um, switch to this other technology. And we have the impetus of climate change. So, um, and you have the inf impetus of bad weather, which means that, you know, certain facilities can't get insured. Um, so, you know, it's sort of like a, a spiral in the sense that even if I get a high oil price for a period of time, it's going to look like it's going to bail everything out that high oil price, like COVID, is going to accelerate all these energy efficiency technologies, all this shifting to different kinds of transportation systems. That it'll, it'll absolutely, add, you know, we, in Europe, people are already blending as an experiment hydrogen into the natural gas pipeline. But to the extent that I have the high oil price to finance it, and costs are going to come down for all these technologies through digitalization and miniaturization, you know, you're like, as an investor, that's why you see investors like, do I want to actually invest in this commodity? Because I think there could be a two-year upcycle. You know, that's why you're seeing people move out of the marketplace and they have not moved out of the marketplace yet for sovereign debt. Um, and, and there, you know, some sovereigns, not every sovereign's the same, but at some point, um, you know, that penalty that, you know, an Exxon Mobil is experiencing or some, you know, Texas E&P, you would imagine that that's going to come into the sovereign market. And can I ask what, one more just very purely geopolitical question, and then we'll open it up and just to sort of, you know, go back on onto, onto the most sort of familiar territory for, for this particular group. What, uh, you know, the, a... a a Russia or Iran, this was the, the old trope, you know, was that uh, with these swelling budgets of dollars by, you know, revisionist petro states, you know, we're able to throw cash around and buy friends and punish enemies. Um, what do you think happens, um, you know, when Iran, Venezuela, Russia have no money, you know, or, and, and like, how does their behavior change? Is the world, you know, is a strong Iran or a weak Iran more of a threat to the region and the world, for example? You know, I think we've already seen some of that. Um, what we've seen is countries were used to being powerful through the petrodollar avenue. And, you know, we did all kinds of smart things to reduce that power. But the problem is, you know, countries have their interests. And I think, at least in the case of Russia, and Iran, we've already seen this discordant result, which is that they've shifted the har harder power option. Um, and, and we've seen, you know, people can say, well, you know, it's this leader or that leader, and they, they, they were inclined to take riskier behavior, or it's the situation, or I'm sure there's some parties out there listening in who say, you know, the United States policy is what pre pre precipitated the riskier behavior, but you know, because I look at everything through the prism of oil and I'm just myopic that way. To me, what happened is people's oil and gas power lessened 
and therefore they still wanted to be powerful and therefore they had to look to other ways to be powerful. And if you multiply that across a wider number of countries, um, the volatility in the geopolitical sphere and in the security sphere that can come uh, could be quite serious. Agreed. If I may jump in on this point, um, countries don't disrupt themselves. Uh, you know, if, if they're having problems paying their bills, they're going to become problematic. They're going to cause issues in, in their neighborhood. And, and that's what you'll see with kind of declining oil revenues for certain countries. So they're, they're going to become more disruptive. Which, of course, at least in the short term, does help oil prices to jump back up a little bit. Ironically. Well, it might not be ironically, you know, I mean. No, it may be deliberately. But I it's, mean, at it's, least it's, in the case of Iran, I like to tell people one of the great enjoyments of uh, being a university professor, of course, is working with young people. And um, I have this game I use in my class. Some In my business class, I tell people it's a negotiation game and my geopolitics class, I tell them I'm just teaching them, you know, what, how the real world revolves around oil, where I actually assign everyone in the class uh, to be a minister from OPEC from different countries. Um, and then someone is Russia, and someone's the United States, and someone's Mexico, and we have an OPEC meeting. And when OPEC meets, you know, if you're not in OPEC, you have to go outside in the hall so you don't actually know what's happening. And uh, every year, you know, for the last 10 years, um, literally every year that I've had the students play this game. Um, the person playing Iran has made a military intervention when it looked like they were gonna lose the game because the price of oil was going down because of effective US policy. Every single game, 90% of the game, the US guy is gonna win, he's gonna get that A plus. He's organized OPEC to do with the United States, what's in alignment with the United States interests. The guy playing Iran doesn't wanna get a C in the course. He starts to get nervous. He starts getting crazier and crazier, you know, and then he comes, because I have this thing where you can come to me and an make an announcement of a news item. You know, one year, the young man playing Iran uh, tried to assassinate the Emir of Bahrain. Uh, one year, they made a war in Yemen. I mean, the students are very realistic to the kinds of things that can happen. And, um, and I think we've, we've seen that uh, kind of behavior uh, when Iran has been boxed in the corner. Um, so, you know, it, 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 it's a real phenomenon. Interesting. <clears throat> Let's try to get a few questions in here. We have a few of them. Um, and you've addressed some of them, but I'm just going to, I'm going to start with China, which I actually thought there would be a little more discussion of, but we've had so much else going on. Um, and the question is basically that China, um, and I'm paraphrasing, it's from Frank Mead, China already has a large presence in Djibouti and is increasing its presence in the Strait of Hormuz and elsewhere. Um, will her debt diplomacy practices, her naval presence, and her Belt and Road incursion into the Arabian Gulf um, foster her financial strength in the U.S.'s political and military withdrawal um, and leave a significant vacuum? Um, what do you think? And I would just say, where does China fit into this conversation that you've had in the next five minutes? <laughs> we'll get to other questions, but I think... Um, so Mahmoud, Mark, let me go first with one point, right? Um, and then I'll let uh, Mahmoud counter it. Because I, I think we have a different perspective. You know, the Chinese are holding almost all of this sovereign debt that's linked to oil. I mean, they're holding a lot of it and they have to worry about their own banks so um, even though they've taken these really extreme geopolitical steps and it, you know, and they're hundred percent focused on Taiwan, um, it's not clear like in the financial world, you know, how exposed are they really? And now I set it up, Mahmoud, give us an opinion. No, I, I, I think, um, I think China has been, um, weaponizing its uh, aid to various countries, has been weaponizing its investment in infrastructure in various countries and so on, because they, they, they bring their own capital, they bring their own labor, and then they hold the debt. Um, I think they're, uh, they're counting on the U.S. eventually creating a vacuum in the global financial system and then having that alternative ready to step in uh, and take over. So I, I, think, I think it's been very deliberate. 
Um, and um, I mean, with China and with Iran, um, countries that have thousands of years of history tend to play the long game, uh, which is something that the U.S. is not experienced at. Uh, we don't think about the long game. We think about election cycles. Um, and I think in the long game, China is very well positioned uh, to carve for itself uh, a region of hegemony, definitely in East Asia, well into Central Asia with, with the Belt and Road Initiative uh, and, and, and making a very strong move into Africa. Um, I think they're holding the threat of completing the pipeline, the Turkey, Iran, Pakistan, China uh, pipeline. Um, as uh, a sword over, over the heads of the Saudis and, and others that, uh, you know, unless you also come into our fold, uh, we can basically uh, push you out and, and, and the Americans won't be there for you. Uh, so I, I think if, if I were a Martian coming to Earth and investing for the next 50 to 100 years, I'd say China is playing it very well and we're not. And, you know, just as a, as a counterpoint to that, of course, you know, first, it, it is natural and indeed consistent with history that, you know, China would have influence in East Asia and in Central Asia, um, as, it, as it historically did, uh, out, you know, but for a brief period, you know, of the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, but, you know, the, the, this is like J. Paul Getty's, uh, you know, edge owe the bank a million, it's your problem, you know, owe the bank a billion, it's the bank's problem, right? And Chinese debt to, you know, Zambia, for example, which was for copper, not for oil, you know, that, that is not, that's not money good now, right? And so what are they going to do, take over the electricity system and be met with thousands and thousands of protesters in the street, you know, who have the same sort of nationalism of any people anywhere in the world. So they continue to roll the debt, right, without it being serviced. 50 billion in Venezuela, right? Now, yes, there's also, you know, 65 billion of sovereign and corporate credit, you know, but it's held by thousands and thousands of discrete portfolios of which it doesn't represent more than a tenth of a percent or whatever, right? Um, you know, at some of it is, yes, it looks, and you're right that they've stimulated labor, right? So they have, you know, lent the money, you yeah. pay the Chinese labor. So that's, you know, essentially stimulus by another name, you know, which is yeah. any country's right. I just wonder, and I'm sorry to like run on about this, but these pipelines, right? Like, you know, like Khrushchev, we can put a map out and draw lines everywhere. And, but, you know, to get oil physically via pipeline from Iran to China, where you have to ford, you know, the Arbor's Mountains, you have to pass demand centers, you go through the desert, the Gobi Desert, you know, the number of pumping stations uh, <laughs> that would be required to move oil, you know, versus the marginal four or five dollars a barrel to ship it, makes it just a lot easier to play nice with people. But I, I you know, I sometimes, I wonder, like, they don't know what to do with their money, kind of as we didn't in the 50s either, you know, and so they're just kind of throwing it out there, and there maybe isn't a grand design. Could I, You're not looking for financial uh, return on that, it. Please. Sorry, could I interject? Um, I, I, I hear Mahmoud's point, but I have great difficulty seeing China, which has essentially, you know, the population is beginning to age, and they have a closed system. Uh, I have great difficulty seeing them into the modern world being essentially run by an elite group of people. And I'm going to go back to what Mahmoud talked about uh, being raised in, in, in Egypt and, and having a seven, 8,000 year perspective. If you think about Athens and Sparta, so Athens was a more open society. Sparta was, you know, a warrior society. They disappeared, but Athens with democracy, um, you know, it's, it perpetuated itself for a longer time. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is that I find it difficult to believe that China will be able to, you know, to morph into something different, which will be more inclusive. And if they're run by a small group of people, then I don't know how that society can progress. But I can certainly see them make advances over the next five years. But look at their behavior in Asia, which is kind of shocking. They had every opportunity to be friendly, just as the US was bungling and sort of like tripping over itself. They've made a, you know, they've, they've, they're kind of militarized, you know, the, the South China Seas. They're arguing with Japan, they're arguing with the Philippines, they're arguing with Vietnam. And now you also have problems with, with India. 
So it's almost peculiar. Why are they being so combative? Why are they being so truculent? When in fact, everything is going their way. You would think, hey, they're the new kids on the block. Everyone is looking at China. Why are they being so disruptive? I would argue it's a small clique of people that has decided to play it a certain way. And because they don't have any other input from the broader population, they do as they will. Don't forget also that China has, if their, their debt to GDP is probably like 300, 350%, and they are still, an, you know, they're still not a fully developed economy. So I don't see the trajectory of their growth being um, somewhere where we're going to be looking 50 years from now and saying, gosh, we were all, remember what we used to say about Japan. In the, in the late 80s, everybody was saying, oh my God, we've got to become Japanese. We have to learn new techniques. No one's even talking about Japan today. So again, from the benefit of history, we need to think through that there are some immediate things that are happening, but there are broader trends at play. Yeah, yeah. but just remember the old joke about I don't need to outrun the bear, I only need to outrun you. Uh, China doesn't need to be strong enough in order to compete against the U.S. hegemony of the 1980s and 1990s. They can weaken the U.S. enough to carve their own domain of influence. So we have two yes. questions that kind of uh, follow from that. Um, one from James Jampel, how should we model out Chinese oil imports? And one that kind of switches it around the other way from Jane Joseph, given the U.S. position as a net exporter, will U.S. GDP decline markedly as a result of persistent low oil prices? And what position should a future administration take regarding this prospect? And we did have a couple of questions about the future administration as well. So maybe follow up on either one of these that you'd like to. Well, I, I, let me take on uh, on the U.S. market. So, um, you know, I think you're going to, I think right now there's been sort of surprisingly little consolidation. You know, people have commented on the fact that we aren't seeing consolidation in the U.S. market. And every company is doing a plan where they're trying to find some asset that they think they can get rid of. Um, to get the cash to drill in their best asset. Um, so the industry is, you know, doing what it, it's, it's throwing whatever it has to do, uh, throw out of the boat uh, to stay afloat. And, um, and, you know, we, I mean, there's an entire array of automated systems that can be put in place. Um, so it might not be the jobs engine that it's been in the past, um, but, you know, we've got companies that have actually drilled a new fracking complex using all computers and not human beings, right? And that this use of automation over time, um, you know, is, is going to lower costs, right? I, I believe McKinsey's done a study, others, I mean, you know, right now, $35 is hobbling the industry, you know, Three years from now or four years from now, $35 might be an easy cost number uh, for some of these companies, especially as they automate and since they've, you know, th fired so many people and it just become a more streamlined industry. And there's a lot of resource. Um, so, but that, you know, sort of begs the question, um, you know, where's the market, right? So is you know, who's the U.S. at that point? Who's the U.S. competing with? And, and I think the big question that's on everybody's mind is where's the demand going to be, right? You know, uh, how, how, you know, COVID raised all these interesting questions, right? People ever going to get back in airplanes the way they did before? You know, after September 11, it took four years um, to get back to the same level of traffic. Uh, that was pretty irrational. Um, I don't know, in a pandemic, it's a little different, I think. Um, you know, and, and also, because we all had to adjust. Um, you know, some of what people did by plane, um, they now realize that why have jet lag when I can do it by teleconference? And, um, and you know, you've got companies saying that they're going to get rid of their office space because um, you know, only a certain number of employees need to actually physically be in the office together and the rest of us, you know, uh, can stay in our vacation home in Idaho because, you know, uh, 
I don't need to be commuting every day, you know, from uh, Connecticut to Wall Street. So, or, or from some, you know, five hour commute in Beijing. So, so I think we're, we're seeing some changes that, you know, could outlast the pandemic and be structural. And of course, the longer the pandemic lasts, the more adjusted we get to this different way of living. And there's a lot of debate, you know, if people live in small towns, they use their car more or less than if they're living in cities. Um, you know, if people are back to cities and there's no pandemic, you know, are they going to live differently? They're not going to commute, maybe, right? So, you know, I, I think there's so much that's changing. And, and then I think we completely don't factor in uh, factors that are related to climate change. You know, two oil refineries closed in California. One of them converted itself to a biodiesel terminal, right? Um, there's a refinery that was for years and years and years operated at a loss in Philadelphia, and it's now closed, not because the investors wanted to bleed out their shareholders, because they would have, but because they couldn't get insurance, right? So I do think that um, some of these climate factors are going to sort of change the calculation, too, for where money gets channeled in, for, for what happens with demand. And, um, you know, this new generation is just a much more flexible um, about changing what they do. You know, I was, did a seminar um, last year, uh, toward the end of the year, with a group of people who are specialists on Brazil. And, you know, everybody is talking about Bolsonaro, and he's not interested in climate change anymore, and they have to worry about deforestation and so forth. And um, there was a young person who was an anthropologist was presenting. And they said that young people all across Brazil, as a social protest, were becoming vegans. That the meat industry and the cattle industry is what was prompting deforestation, and they were going to handle it as a silent individual social protest by becoming vegans. And as I've met people of our generation from Brazil, they've said the same thing. They're becoming vegan. And like, I mean, Brazil, like you would not think that <laughs> vegan culture is on the rise in Brazil. Like that would be something that, you know, wouldn't be expected. So I just think it's very hard to predict um, where demand's gonna go and, and that's gonna be really pivotal. So we're out of time, actually we're over time. And so I want to um, just wrap up here. We have a ton of questions that came in, which means we're gonna have to have you all back. Um, because apparently this is a topic that um, needs answers and exploration. Um, among them, questions about food insecurity, renewables, climate change, and various uh, parts of the world, which we sort of got to at the end. So um, I just want to thank you all so much for this. This was extraordinary amount of information to give us in a very um, succinct and brief uh, period of time. And you, and you just did a wonderful job. And so I, I'm sure our audience that can't clap for you, so I'm clapping for them. So thank you very much. And I expect to see you all back here. And Danny, thank you. Bye. <laughs>